two respondents up, Lou and Monica. That's who they are. They're still here. Um, so, uh, so uh, there's obviously no space for me on the sofa this time. Annoyingly, <laughs> I will perch here. Uh, I think I'll, I'll start with you, Lou, seeing as you've got the microphone. Um, you have been very involved in developing e-cigarette standards in America. You and your organization aims to have developed um, one of the uh, cornerstones of the early uh, part of standards development in e-cigarettes for e-liquid manufacturing. You've listened to uh, the three presenters. Maybe you could share with us what, what you feel um, you got out of, uh, out of those and how you feel you might improve what AIMSA does based on what you've heard. Are we on? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, I, this morning has really been kind of fascinating for me. Sometimes you get so involved in something that you can kind of start to lose a little bit of the forest for the trees. Um, so I made a couple of notes this morning, and, and I'd like to just share some of the, the highlights that jumped out at me. Um, the never-ending process, I completely agree with, because I think that we're all on the learning curve, um, and we have to look at and see what happens long term. And this is going to be an evolving science, an evolving approach, evolving technologies, innovations. Um, facilitating and not stagnating innovation, I think, was another very important uh, point, and I think it was something that we focused on with AMSA. Starting, uh, having a, min a minimal acceptable starting place. Um, again, something we, we really believe in in AMSA. We focused on smaller manufacturers, and um, our motto was reasonable, realistic, and sustainable. And I, I think that is something that we need to, to collectively focus on. Um, it's an absolute essential is having that starting place. I, I, was, I really like the monograph idea that, that we heard this morning. Um, and, and one of the things that we found in AIMSA, we've been operating for two and a half years, and we found that there are certain baselines. And we all know that, that, that between the FDA and the, the Tobacco Control Act and the TPD and some of the other regulatory directions we're seeing around the country are, are really going in the tobacco regulatory direction, and most of us don't agree with that. Um, but it, it seems to be a reality, at least for now, unless we get some kind of legislative changes. And some of the things we found, at least with the liquid component of this in terms of the monograph approach are we, we've established certain baselines. We've established a, a quality verification process with evidentiary documentation and product analysis um, for all the ingredients and certain, certainly the primary ones. Um, environments, content act, nic quality, uh, nicotine content accuracy, manufacturing environments, packaging, transparency, and so forth. All of our details are actually up on the poster. You can take a look at some of those. Um, and then hearing you know, Clyde is, is just, I, mean, I get to meet a lot of these people at some of these conferences, and Clyde, Clyde is just great. His, his glide path um, got me thinking about something from college, which you know, I, it was one of those things I thought, I don't know if I'm ever going to use this. And all of a sudden, some 30 years later, I'm, I'm thinking about something I studied in college called the critical path method. And the critical path method, in very short order, has a starting place and an ending place and a whole series of, of essential nodes between where you are and where you need to be. And it's trying to find the most efficient and effective way to accomplish all of the nodes between your starting point and your ending place. And in, I'm coming to realize that it's something that I don't think we together collectively have ever really done. I don't think we've sat down and established what, is, what are the nodes, what are all the nodes, um, smart charging in devices, um, some of the, the standardization for atomizers and, and, and so forth. Um, so I think that that's something that, that, you know, having a critical path will take us in a direction of, of looking at this more, more holistically with, with liquids and electronics, atomizing, and, and taking us in a direction towards aerosols, um, then toxicology, secondhand exposures, and ultimately policy. Thanks, Lou. Um, Monica, you're fairly new to vapor, um, less, less than a year, which uh, a few years ago would have been a veteran in the industry. And you have a background in, in pharmaceutical and life sciences, so maybe you have some, some observations that, that, that someone else might, might have missed that you'd like to share, share with everybody before we go on to some questions. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. It's been very enjoyable. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, I'm quite a newcomer to the field, and so 
starting out, I've been fascinated about all the areas that it's touched and especially all the progress that's been made and the coming together of the many different bodies to try to move forward giving the TPD um, challenge that we're facing right now, as well as trying to learn from other areas appropriate for this topic today, you know, as it touches um, technology innovation, uh, pharmaceutics, but not only that, inhalation development. Someone mentioned that's one of the most challenging routes of administration to approve. So yeah, they're faced with another challenge, e-liquid formulation, toxicology, cytotoxicity. Um, so I'm just wondering, uh, I found definitely the OTC pre um, presentation very informative and most applicable in a sense. But one thing I'm considering if I understand um, whether or not to bypass the FDA is dictated based on the impl implementations of the ABI, the active pharmaceutical ingredient. Um, but then you also, also mentioned that nicotine is something that would have to, in fact, go through the FDA. Now, is this a process that would be entailed with the same rigor as getting a drug completely into market? Or do we um, look at things as a risk-based assess, as assessment, such as Jack mentioned, such as in the case of stomach cancers or refrigeration systems, where we know there's a, a major need into it, so then we build the regulations as we go. So I just want to get a feel for that. Okay, that seemed to be a, a question directed at Jack, so maybe you could pass the microphone along, and then we'll go out to the floor. For sure, it's a great point. <clears throat> and right now, the OTC monograph uh, process is under the Division of Growth, the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. These products will be under the Tobacco Center, but increasingly, FDA is having the centers work together. Uh, Mitch Seller, by the way, who heads the Tobacco Center, was an advocate that the different centers must work together and learn from each other and harmonize within each other. So in principle, there's nothing to stop the FDA from saying, you know what, we're going to use the monograph approach for tobacco. It and with tobacco, we have actually more flexibility because we can use a public health standard and say almost any of these things are much less harmful than cigarettes and be more flexible if they choose. And then the what is exciting and scary is where they set the standard, you know, for this water. If it's too stringent, the water would be too expensive. If it's too low, <coughs> it's not acceptable. <coughs> Same thing applies here. So what we need is an approach like that that is flexible and accommodates diversity. And the other thing that was important was FDA recognized it couldn't be so high that you eliminated small makers. They wouldn't be able to afford it. So how did you accommodate that and set the standard? And today, FDA focuses very much on incentivizing innovation. That's their words. So they're looking at how do we incentivize innovation, accommodate small developers, and satisfy diverse consumer demands and needs. And that's very much what I hope we will see come out of the tobacco center with their regulation. We all need to work to make that happen. What I'm seeing here today, I think, will help the FDA. Okay, so let's let's see if there's anything, if there's anyone else out there who has any further questions for the panel. Uh, I see one over here. Is there anyone else? I'll just try and do three at a time. Well, if anyone gets inspired in the meanwhile, just put your hands up. This is for, of course, Jack and Lou, but if the other panelists would like to chime in. Um, what are your overall thoughts about the proposed regulations on tobacco and unregulated tobacco products? This is going to be coming out from the FDA shortly. Is there anything in particular that you find egregious in that document? The, the whole document? Yes. Yeah. Uh, there's one over here. Okay. 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 You want to take a couple of these, Peter? Or are we going to take I'm going to take, one take three at a time if I can. Okay. Ron Bowen from Australia. There's been a lot of talk about the generalities and a lot of talk about moving gradually and taking the, the low uh, hanging fruit, if you like. Uh, I, but there hasn't been a lot of statements about what that low hanging fruit should be, uh, of what other things we should be targeting first, and perhaps looking at the uh, presentation this morning of the things that were excluded because they're part of the EU, EU directive on the size of the bottles that levels of nicotine and things like that. Uh, outside the EU, those don't hold as, uh, as standards, but they're things that we don't need to think about. Are they the right ones, or should we be having different ones? 
And is there a third? Or will we just, yeah, here we go. Hello, Norbert Schmidt, uh, John Weber. Uh, as far as I can tell, the uh, dooming regulation in, uh, in the US is about similar to the TPD with the requirements on uh, registration and testing for individual products. Like uh, in Denmark, they uh, implemented this this way that any variety of product has to go through the same registration with fees and tests and the fees alone would be uh, 1400 euros about uh, with, renew with re annual renewal fees and with each uh, and that for each product variety which would kill effectively kill the whole uh, plethora of uh, liquids on the market nobody can afford it uh, or to register all this. Uh, only uh, the big tobacco companies who uh, produce a very limited uh, product series can afford uh, all these registrations. So uh, how, what can we do to use a more sensible approach uh, for small manufacturers with variety? Okay, so three questions. Firstly is, is there anything wrong with the deeming regulation, or maybe better phrases there even right with the deeming regulation? Um, how do we, uh, do we help small manufacturers? And if the standards in TPD are wrong, like 10 mil and 20 mil per mil, which some of us in this room would suggest that they probably are, then where should we set those kinds of limits? So I'll, I'll leave it up to you to sort of, to sort of divide that one up. I, I have the microphone, I'll, I'll take a quick stab at all three and I'll pass, pass it around. Um, for the, the regulations, uh, the FDA is currently considering under what's called an NPRM, or Notice of Proposed Rulemaking as it's currently established. Um, I believe that the FDA was under considerable political pressure to get something out. And I think they began to realize, uh, we've had four different listening sessions with them just at AIMSA, um, and they've had plenty of others with the industry. So I think they're beginning to grasp now the complexities and um, the, the nuances and, and really the dynamics uh, of these product lines, especially with the open systems. And at TMA recently, we got to listen to uh, David Ashley, the director of the Center to, of uh, Science for, for CTB. And his presentation slides made it kind of more clear that they are starting to grasp some of the complexities and dynamics involved. Um, so I, I think that what happened with the NPRM is that they, they were under so much pressure that they really didn't try to come out with anything too specific. I think they gave, left themselves a lot of wiggle room. Um, they realized that they have to deem first before they start tackling some of the issues like flavoring and some of the, the more micro level issues. And that's really what I anticipate seeing in the next month if they come out with something. I think we're just going to see a deeming with a more to come um, as, as the process unfolds. And I think that the current NPRM just has a massive sledgehammer at the end of it that, that could really wipe us out. And, and you know, we'll have to see. I mean, the, the AIMSA public comment submission, which is on our website, is quite comprehensive. But the basic premise of it that we take is both from both legal and science uh, directions with citations for every point that we make, um, is that there's a lot of flexibility that the FDA has in, in how much and how they choose to apply the Tobacco Control Act. And we also don't believe it belongs as a tobacco product. We think we're technology products. And we believe that Congress needs to pass a completely separate set of regulatory body regulation framework that it takes into the specific group dynamics and, uh, that we believe are, are, are extensive. To go to your quick question on, on the what you call the low-hanging fruit, uh, AIMS actually has a very, very specific set of standards for e-liquid. Now, it's a starting place. It's certainly not an ending place. We have the full set on our website, and they're also on a poster outside. You can take a look at them. We get very specific into the quality of the nicotine. It has to be verified with evidentiary documentation, random product analysis, uh, USP certified to go into the entire chain of custody. Um, everything from the manufacturing environment, what's allowed in there, toxic chemicals, how nicotine has to be stored, um, a cleaning processes, hand washing processes, packaging, traceability, tamper evidence, 
it, it's really quite comprehensive. And we believe that that's ultimately where standards are going to end up going. It's just a question of finding the right standards and doing it in a way that can become an evolving process as we get more science. And of course, we're also interested in facilitating the ongoing scientific analysis. Uh, we, we funded, between the aims that we internally funded a, a plasma nicotine absorption level study, which has become a landmark study for uh, the start, starting place of, of pharmacokinetics. Uh, and that's a published study by Dr. Constantinos Marcellinos. It's readily available. Um, and to, to your question in, in terms of how the smaller company is going to deal with this, based on the, the current structure of the NPRM um, and what they're recommending under what's called PMTA, the, the pre-market tobacco uh, application process, um, it's a real problem because the application process in the U.S. is, is so monstrous. I mean, they're saying that it's going to take 5,000 hours per SKU. And if we're talking about e-liquids, if you've got a company that's got 50 varying flavors and you've got four different nicotine levels, there's 200 applications right there. If you've got two different dilution, dilution, diluent ratios, you're now going to 400 applications. So we don't have a way of putting a financial estimate on what each of those applications might cost. I've heard estimates as high as $3 million. So I mean, there's no way that the smaller manufacturer is going to come, come off pulling off $3 million times 200 SKUs. You know, it's just, you know, we know where that's going to go. So we believe that, that the, the um, monograph concept under the baselines that, that we found to be very, very easily obtainable and consistent, especially by smaller manufacturers, such as verifying and maintaining consistent quality of nicotine, other ingredients and in the verification process, uh, environments, packaging, and so forth. We, we, we think that's the direction that we're arguing for. And I just think we're going to have to kind of wait and see where the governments go in this direction. There's just so much political pressure right now. And um, unfortunately, this industry is not getting the media coverage on a balanced basis to bring out what's really been accomplished and what's happening in conferences like these. So we've tried to bring some of that information out by posting videos of these expert presentations on the ERF website. Uh, a, a couple of uh, quick comments. I mean, one, it, it, the, the risk of over-regulation uh, and I think the, it's, it's very real. Uh, regulators, by their nature uh, and, and by law, are risk averse. And I think it's an interesting mental exercise to say, what if we had regulatory authorities in charge of things like the internet, software, mobile phones, as they were first coming out? And, and they're saying, well, we need to protect the public from something that might go wrong. Uh, you know, let's put these standards in first, and, and let's think of everything that might go wrong and protect people from that. I mean, would we have any of those technologies? You know, what's, what's an appropriate level of regulation in order to try to move to where you're going to get? And that's even more important when there's a, a pre-existing technology, in this case, combustion-based delivery of nicotine, that people are using. Uh, picking up on, on your question, Ron, of uh, low-hanging fruit, uh, d despite being a, a lawyer, I, I would think maybe we're looking at low-hanging fruit that isn't actually legal related to begin with, it's knowledge. I mean, we look at what happened that allowed us to come forward with decent regulations in other areas, and it was public knowledge of what the harms were. So a book like Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, talking about what was happening in meatpacking plants in Chicago, created the demand to move to sensible regulation of uh, food products, of, of meatpacking. Uh, the scandals from the 1930s about medicinal products you know, caused the, the public demand to move to other things. You know, what put the pressure on politicians to come up with something that would really work? We move into this area and the public awareness of relative risk, you know, is abysmal. You know, the people who believe that products like snus are as hazardous as cigarettes or more hazardous, the people who believe there isn't a big risk differential between electronic cigarettes uh, and combustion cigarettes. I, I think that is a huge problem and it seems to be moving in, in the wrong direction. But if you're looking for something even basic on relative risk, if I go to the CDC website to think, is it a good idea to wear sunscreen or not? Uh, you know, will condoms protect you from sexually transmitted diseases? Is wearing a seatbelt a good idea? Well, all these things about relative risk, there is terrific information. And if I want to make an argument to somebody that you should use non-combustion, forms of nicotine rather combustion based and they say okay show me what uh, what the CDC has to say on that there isn't anything 
There is no authoritative source, a governmental source, for information on relative risk. The public doesn't know it, and hence you don't have the, the, the pull from consumers for the sorts of things that we can get. And I think getting out that sort of information would be huge because it's like people saying, that's what they're doing in the meatpacking plants? You know, I'm not going to buy that stuff unless I see something different. I'm really angry about this. And we haven't managed to do that with uh, issues of nicotine and, and, and differential uh, delivery. And I think that would be a really key step to get there for, for the public to actually know about it. Okay, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, so if anyone else, I see I've got a bit of that. Yeah. I'd like to do Jeff. Can we just, we'll just take this question first and then Jack can, can come up? Okay. Thank you. Uh, Rudy, I'm a lot with Intertap Labs. Uh, my question on regulation, David, when you talked about the different regulations and the different successes, uh, especially in the United States, wouldn't it be deemed in the United States or worldwide that the regulation of combustible tobacco has been one of the greatest failures to protect the public? And I noticed it wasn't one of your examples of yeah. success. Yeah. Uh, and the political motivation, at least within the United States, is quite visible to push the FDA to get it, as it were, get it right this time. And as vaping is deemed as a derivative of combustible smoking, and that's how it is within the populist viewpoint, uh, that the belief is before uh, going ahead uh, and having the government make any statement that they want to look at it, uh, restrict it, make sure they get it right this time, uh, because right now we have a nation and a world of addicted uh, smokers uh, that, uh, as we know, millions and millions of people are dying from related diseases and causes from that. So an abundance of caution in the public eye is something that outweighs small businesses, technology, innovation, until the definitive science is there on a different method to inhale. Okay, if there is one more, we've got time for one more question on here. Uh, Mark Seyman, Switzerland for Helvetic Way, which is a consumer organization. Um, uh, I, I really see the point that we need, also we as consumer organization, we, need, we say we need regulation, but all this regulation which is out right now is coming from the scaremongering of the press and making things worse as they really are. I really see uh, a point which uh, Inga Wahlberg presented as the amount of smokers uh, in Sweden before and what they have now in 2014 which was reduced in a really huge amount. It, it, broke down to about a third of the starting point, but the snooze users just went up for about 5%. And I think that's the real goal where regulation should go for. Keep it open, make it at the minimum level so that the minimum security is done, but keep it open for the manufacturers. Because uh, on the way it's going now, the only product which is allowed on, under the TPD is going in the direction of cigarettes, and that won't work. So that's something all the regulators have to face to. So a couple of comments there. Would you just just hear uh, Jack and then maybe, maybe Inga and Monica before we before we close up uh, briefly, very quickly. First, your comments about LPA. I completely agree with. For better and for worse, they operate in a social, political environment, and there is enormous pressure on FDA not to kill this category. If they did that, there would be hearings before Congress, there, it would be a firestorm. Um, the other thing is that FDA is operating very transparently. How many in this room have either commented to FDA written, or in their organizations, or been in public hearings? You have. <laughs> I mean, just in this room, FDA has been getting, it's been very public, and so FDA is hearing what we're all saying. They have to consider this stuff when they make the regulation. The other thing is they understand that there is no standard that is the right one, so they keep talking about evolving. Now, how does that incentivize innovation? 
Well, the companies that, are, that do not have good imagination and design and manufacture, they're not going to be out there very long. The ones they anticipate and want to be around three, four, five years, they're going to build better products, going to what David's points were earlier. And that's a way that FDA understands that it can incentivize innovation. Uh, personally, I, I would also like to point out uh, to uh, combat uh, smoking, you, you need a lot of alternatives, uh, safer alternatives. People are different and uh, they, they want uh, to uh, choose between different types of products. So uh, I think uh, uh, from e-cigarettes, uh, new types of uh, CME pharmaceutical products uh, to uh, smokeless uh, products should uh, really be part of the future and not or easily coming into the market. That's my view. Can I add a quick comment to that? How many of you are familiar with the Surgeon General report, the 50th anniversary, 2014? Chapter 15 and 16 are very blunt, and they say that public health will be served by moving people away from combustible to non-combustible. It says electronic products, innovative smokeless products can be part of the solution. The people at FDA have read that. I'm not sure if the current CDC director has read it. <laughs> 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 I'll just finish up. Um, so we did like to agree that regulations need to be put in place and standards are required. We also agree that timing is of the essence. Um, I think, in my humble opinion, in that we should really look at the risk-based approach and evaluate, you know, at what points during the manufacturing process, during the e-liquid formulation, are we most likely to introduce something unintentionally harmful to the consumer. Um, as Catherine pointed out with um, in, in the earlier session, looking at the um, Cider toxicity of the flavor components. You know, if we can build, focus on building a decent big database, knowing the raw chemical flavors that we can use, which will still um, fuel innovation between these smaller companies, um, who can pick point and make different concentrations and variations for these e liquid flavors, as well as say for the hardware, it's a fast-moving technology. You know, unfortunately, if we do have to reduce the tank size to two ml or whatnot, but um, this will maybe. And another, in another perspective, fuel innovation in that you're left with, you have to be more creative in that you're left with less um, options to work with. So if you evaluate certain materials, um, stainless steel 316, for example, or different um, wick um, innovations in terms of wicking uh, material fibers to move forward, just really evaluate from a consumer safety rather than just throwing a bunch of standards in place. Uh, David, any final words? I think I have more than my share. I'm gonna go ahead and pass on David. So have I, but I'll talk anyway. Um, <laughs> I, I think picking up on the on the idea of what hasn't worked in regulation, yet cigarettes, nicotine, uh, it's really hard to top that example. So that we've got a product that's being used. I mean, somewhere around one and a quarter billion people on the planet are getting nicotine by sucking smoke into their lungs. You know, cigarettes, uh, biddies, uh, pretext. Um, on cigarettes alone, they're spending over $700 billion a year, and most of them are saying, I don't want to be doing this. We have the technology that would allow them to have an alternative, and we don't know, you know just how far we could get in terms of reducing risk, because there's still going to be some risk associated with nicotine, but we know we could reduce risk based on the snooze example by you know, high 90s percent, you know, maybe not 100 percent, but darn close to it. And we've had various entrepreneurs who have seen this. I mean, I deal with venture capitalists and merchant bankers and whatever, and, and they look at this and say, I've never seen such a slam dunk. You know, usually we, we look at putting hundreds of millions of dollars into something with a very high failure rate. This, I mean, how could you go wrong? I mean, they're already spending hundreds of billions of dollars, you know, buying a product that they say they don't want, that's gonna kill them, and we can give them a product that will meet their needs and not cause them harm, or cause them very little harm, and yet, over the last decades, we've seen people do this. And Swedish Match is a really good example, but if you look at advanced therapeutic products or some of the early heat not burn products, some of the pharmaceutical products, we have either banned them or so heavily regulated them to 
preclude them from being decent competitors to cigarettes. So we keep protecting the cigarette market because we're so afraid of what might happen. Uh, and that is so counterproductive because in part it causes the people who could be making the investments, the innovation that FDA says it wants to encourage, it scares them away because you see somebody who does this and they get shut down. And we look at now that those who are, are looking at this market and saying, wow, you can consolidate the vape market the way that Starbucks consolidated the coffee shop market. You can you create a company worth tens of billions of dollars just giving good, consistent product to people in an, in an environment that they would want. But I'm not putting money into it because the government might be about to close it down. Uh, and, and companies who, who look at this and say, huge potential to make a lot of money while saving millions and millions of lives. But it looks like it's going to be closed down. You know, why would I go into that? What they need is the idea that, you know, like in automobiles, to say, if you come up with a safety feature that can further reduce the death rate, you will make a lot of money. So you have an incentive to develop, you know, better features. And what we've done is we've created this huge disincentive. You know, we, we've allowed cigarettes to be a nicotine maintenance monopoly and kept them there. And it makes absolutely no sense from a regulatory standpoint. It is so counterproductive from a public health standpoint. And it's gone on for decades. It's a question now, do we have enough momentum with things like electronic cigarettes that we can't, that bad policy can't get in the way now? That this, this is going to have a life, you can't simply kill it off. And I think that's a big question that we now face as we look at these products. And with that, um, we have come to lunchtime. So thank you all for taking part. It's been an interesting session, I think. Um, what's interesting is, from a personal perspective, I've been doing this for two and a half years now, and I've been very lucky to work with some, some great people in the industry who've been doing some very interesting things. And when we started out, the argument that we were having was based on what this product is not. So it was based on an argument about us not being a medical product arguments about us not being a tobacco product. And those were arguments that we had to have and those were arguments that we felt it was important that we win. But they were also not particularly productive arguments when we look back on them because we didn't really achieve anything in terms of trying to figure out what we should be, where we should sit and how we should behave as an industry. And with any luck this session has gone some way to trying to take us a little bit further along that journey. Thank you very much. Now you can go. <laughs>